Sheikh, yes. One of the challenges of having very distinguished speakers on your panel is how do you slip them this note which says there's only two minutes left. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Reverend William Lane, who is going to speak on the Christian perspective on social justice. Uh, Reverend William Lane has been a very good partner of the Delaware Council. He has participated in our past events, and uh, without much ado. Thank you. My name is uh, William Lane. I'm a priest in the Episcopal Church, and I'm here to share some brief thoughts about social justice, political action, and its foundation base for us Christians, which is primarily in the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. I think the, the Hebrew and Greek scriptures that have informed uh, those who have sought social justice and entered into political activism as Christians, especially in my lifetime, I think of the Protestant Christian theologian martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany. I think of Mother Teresa, the Roman Catholic servant of God in India, Martin Luther King Jr., the Baptist martyr here in our country, and Desmond Tutu, the Anglican servant of the Lord in South Africa. I believe that all religions, or at least the religions I have had some contact with, uh, proclaim a quest and a hope for justice and call for those who adhere to that faith to be servants of justice. I know it is for sure with the three monotheistic religions that have their roots in the part of the world we call the Middle East. As an Episcopalian in the Anglican Christian tradition, I view the interface of faith and life through three lenses, reason, tradition, and scripture. And for the purpose of brevity this morning, I'm going to focus on scripture. Again, for Christians, the Hebrew, Greek scriptures. In the opening chapter of Genesis, in the first account of creation, there comes that momentous moment when God says, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And indeed, we're told that God blesses humankind and gives dominion over all that moves on the earth to it. And I think that at least one question that follows is then, how does God intend for humankind to live out that gift, live into faithfully that privilege? And for me, I find the simplest response to this in the book of the prophet Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my creation, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. In the Gospel according to Luke, in the Greek scriptures, Jesus, upon his return from his wilderness experience after his baptism, goes into Galilee and returns home to Nazareth. And there in the synagogue, he opens the Isaiah scroll and reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, 
because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then he concluded with this from Isaiah, is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. And then to the consternation of some, he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he identifies himself with that great image of the coming of the kingdom of God. And in the Luke's gospel account, from the lips of the child woman Mary comes this magnificent hymn that we in the Christian community call the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, and he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. So God is a God of justice and righteousness. And we, humankind, have been created to live out this justice and thus be accounted as righteous. As Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad did before us, living this out in the context of the worlds they found themselves in, as minorities in the midst of oppression, occupation, and slavery. Worlds where justice too often depended upon the benevolence of those in power, not seen as a God given right. And Jesus drives this home with his parable of Lazarus and the rich man. You may know this parable. There was a rich man dressed in purple and fine linen, and there was a poor man named Lazarus who sat outside his gates day after day just looking for a little crumb of food. And the rich man, we can image it, just kind of stepped over him, kept on going inside to the party. And then the rich man, Lazarus, dies and has his reward, his grace in heaven with, in the company of our father Abraham. And then the rich man dies and is buried, and he ends up in Hades, in hell, and he calls out to get a little help and is reminded that he had all his, and Lazarus had none, and now Lazarus lived in grace and he lived and lives in hell. For people of faith, political activism is nothing more, nothing more than living out our created gift of being in the likeness and image of God, a God of justice and righteousness. Nothing more than that, but that's everything, huh? Nothing more than that, but that's everything. It's being faithful to that which we have been created to be. And it is through political action that we present, not only present, but we insist upon God's justice in the several communities of our society. Such action must always be measured by its commitment to justice and mercy and must be exercised in humility, not with hubris. The systems we speak the word of justice of God to may and quite often react out, out of fear to it. When they come on like big bullies, it's because they're fearful, like a bully is. Fear of loss of power and status, fear of the cost of justice, the cost that justice will mean for their own benefits. And there may be a cost to such activism. As we spoke earlier, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King, and you can name a continuum of them. Those who do not desire the word of the Lord can and often do make it uncomfortable for those who speak it and live it. They cast the uns, you know the uns, don't you? They cast the uns upon those who speak justice to authority and power. In our own country, it could be unpatriotic, un-American. But our responsibility must be that we're not willing to be another un, that is unfaithful to that which we have been created.
created to be. We Christians pray, our Father who is in heaven, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I thought about that this morning as I was driving here after the events that we've all been living in and over the, well, it seems like forever, but most immediately this past week. And I was thinking about the kingdom of God and thinking about the fear that comes upon people when such things as this happen. Fear, I'm sure, that for some of us may be thought about once, at least a half a moment, about coming to a gathering because it seems like it can happen anywhere. But our Father in heaven, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And that kingdom is the kingdom of God's justice and God's righteousness. That's what we pray for. I think we Christians have gotten so used to saying that prayer that we don't comprehend what we're praying for. We're praying for the turning the world upside down. And our presence here is saying that whether we're, whatever faith community we come out of, we are for justice and peace and righteousness and mercy in humility. And yes, indeed, the world does need to be turned upside down.